Hi, my name is Teresa Nesbitt. And I'm William Brogdon. We are both uh, research services librarians at the University of North Georgia on their coming campus. Yes, and coming campus is a commuter campus, which is kind of where the genesis of this idea came from, of talking about um, planning events and programming for commuter students. Um, personally, I've found that when I've gone to a lot of conferences um, and I attend sessions on programming for academic libraries, usually it centers around events that sound really exciting in the moment, but when I go back and try to think practically about how we could carry out events like that for commuter students, um, it just doesn't work with that population. So like, for example, um, I remember being really excited about one library lock-in idea that somebody had done, but there's commuter students just would not be able to make the time for such an event. There might not be interest. And so there really are separate and special considerations for event planning for commuter students. Um, so over the course of this presentation, we are going to be focusing on talking about um, commuter students. Who are they? Why it's still important to build community building events and engagement events into um, library work for these commuter students, and also some of the special considerations that you might want to take into account when planning these events to make the event successful and useful for our commuter students. Part of this is that Teresa and I have had a wide experience with commuter students on different campuses. Um, but we've noticed that there's a lack of how to engage students, uh, commuter students, in the literature, and they often get ignored. Um, so we're going to give a little bit of background about where we worked and where we work now, and the commuter students that we interact with. So I started off my library career at the McDonough uh, Henry Counter Center of Mercer. Um, and a lot of the commuter students came from around that area, but had a lot of other obligations. They had families, they had full-time jobs, and they came to school in the evening. So uh, sometimes that took them away from their families in the evening, once a week, twice a week. And it was very difficult for them to stay on campus to participate in any activities um, when they just wanted to go home and see their family. Uh, I've also uh, moved up to the Mercer Atlanta campus, uh, which is a commuter campus primarily focused on graduate students. Uh, the Henry County Center had a mix of graduate and undergraduate, and the Atlanta campus had mostly graduate students in professional and graduate programs like nursing, pharmacy, and they both had uh, their fair share of education students that I interacted with. Um, so these students definitely had little time for clubs, little time for student activities. A student uh, body organization was basically non-existent at the Henry County Center. So finding ways to engage these students uh, is always a challenge. And my prior experience was in the technical college system. So I worked at two different campuses at Southern Crescent Technical College, Flint River and Griffin. Both were commuter campuses and our students were often non-traditional. So as William mentioned, we had a lot of older students who had outside obligations, who had families and who pretty much just came into the library to print and then go home. Uh, and so it was definitely interesting cutting my teeth, learning how to plan events in this environment. So, um, and then both of us work at the coming campus now at North Georgia, which is also a commuter campus. And um, we have a lot of dual enroll students. I think they make up uh, about 20% of our student body. Is that right, William? I think so. Uh, but these yeah. dual enroll students are uh, skew a bit long younger than what I have been used to. Uh, high school age, um, definitely a different uh, group of uh, students than the older professional population at Mercer's campuses. Yeah, so our experience with commuter students has kind of been all over the lot. We've had um, experience working with a lot of different populations. and. I think that kind of reflects the diversity of commuter students in general. So um, it's they're not a homogenous group. When you talk about commuter students, you're talking about 
90% of college students in the United States, so a very large chunk of our students. Um, some of them, as William mentioned, may be grad students, they may be older, they may have family obligations. Some might be dual enrolled students who are still living with their parents, who are getting driven to campus, um, who don't really have a lot of flexibility with how they come on and off campus. So all of this adds up to a population that doesn't necessarily have time for extracurricular activities outside of their classwork, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't want that on-campus engagement. All right, so when we're talking about defining a sense of community on a college campus, so you'll see uh, definitions like this one from Lounsbury and Denoy, where um, community on campus is defined by a feeling of togetherness, of investment in the community, commitment to the setting, feeling that um, the community cares about their welfare and their success as a student, and all of these qualities are really important indicators of student persistent um, success during their time. So if this sense of community is lacking, if students don't feel like they have a chance for this kind of community building, um, then this could hinder them or hamper them in their progress as a student. This is an area where libraries can really step in and fill that void. If there isn't a sense of community life on a commuter campus, libraries are in a position to provide that. Because um, commuter students, just because they don't necessarily have the time to um, participate in really like time consuming on campus activities, it doesn't mean that they don't want to be involved. So libraries can kind of change the way that they approach programming and event planning to accommodate commuter student interests, commuter student needs, and their time limitations as well. So this is where we're going to move into kind of giving some general tips and advice on how to plan events for commuter students. So these are going to be kind of broad because as we mentioned, there is no prototypical commuter student. Um, they're a very diverse group and it's just a general set of points to think about when doing event planning. So also, we are, uh, uh, commuter libraries don't always have a large staff, usually only one of two librarians or staffers there. Um, so we haven't done an exhaustive study on this. Uh, these are just kind of quick and dirty ideas to get started that may or may not work in every situation. Yes, that is a very good point. <laughs> That's another feature of working on a commuter campus is that you often don't have a very large staff. So um, we do not have a user experience librarian. We don't have anyone dedicated to assessment. So this is just us trying to figure out the best way to do things from our own experience. <laughs> So some things you want to consider are just, even if you don't have that dedicated UX librarian, just finding ways to get a better idea of who your student body is. So who are your students? Um, what is their relationship with the library space? Do they use it between classes as a place to kind of sit down and um, get some studying in before their next class? Do they view it as a community space where they can get together with their friends? How do they view the library? Um, also, what are their interests? So what are your students? Um, what gets their attention? What appeals to their demographic? Um, and some ways in which we have tried to do this is by paying attention to student groups on campus. So. Um, trying to find those students who are already making attempts to build community on campus and partnering with them. So one example that we can give of this is from the coming campus. We had um, a gardening group briefly at coming and um, these students were super invested. They built a little community garden out in front of the campus and um, they would take care of it every day. And they're a small but dedicated group. So um, we worked with them to try to see uh, what they would be interested in seeing the library provide in terms of events. So in the spring of, I believe it was 2018, 
we invited somebody from the Appalachian Studies Department to host a workshop on urban gardening. So she taught our students how to make sub-irrigated planters out of these $1 Home Depot buckets. And um, it turned out as we were planning the event, we realized that we had um, inadvertently scheduled it on the same day as the Student Government Association. So instead of trying to compete with them, we partnered with SGA and we kind of collaborated our marketing efforts. And um, you'll see on the right hand side, the spring day uh, flyer, we tried to kind of market them in tandem instead of trying to compete with each other. So um, it's really important to identify those groups on campus that are already doing things and to work together with them because that'll give you a good barometer, not only of what students are interested in, but also amplify your voice because these students will do a lot of the marketing and promotion for you too. Um, and another thing that you can do is just ask students what they want. So at the Southern Crescent campus, we would leave up a whiteboard every semester um, asking students to just um, jot down what kind of programs and events they would like to see at the library. And we got a lot of good feedback that way. So um, students mostly just wanted food. <laughs> that was one of the common themes that we saw a lot. <laughs> so I got involved with regular APA workshops held on the Atlantic campus. Now these usually drew small crowds and they were advertised both at the Atlanta campus and the regional campus that I worked at. Um, and that, in the last few years I noticed that quite a few students that were coming to these workshops happened to be uh, students that I had in McDonough. Um, and I wondered why this was. Uh, some of them said it was just held at a good time and they felt like their uh, academic responsibility encouraged them to do that. Uh, some lived in Atlanta and just happened to go to class down at uh, McDonough. Um, some uh, said it was a good time. We occasionally had them in the evening, some during the day, um, maybe even during the weekend. Um, these were usually sparsely attended, uh, but still a good time with the students. Another way in which we try to accommodate the busy lives of our commuter students um, who can't necessarily book a time to come to a specific event or program is we try to engage in a lot of passive programming and just have stations up for a prolonged period of time where students can stop by at their own pace to participate. So on the left hand side, um, you'll see an example of an event we do every year at coming, which is a Black History Month display, where we post photographs of black luminaries, whether they're authors or artists or public figures, and we ask students to test their knowledge to see how many of these figures they can identify, and um, they enter their answers to win a prize. And it's a very simple event to set up, and it's just a way to engage students where they can drop by any time through the month of February to participate. With the Valentine's making station, um, this is definitely a passive event that we just have set up the whole week of uh, right before Valentine's Day so students can come and go and work as they please. It's a really um, good event for the students to work out some of their creative energies. Um, it's not dependent on student schedules since it's up all the time. It brings students into the library space because they see their friends with their uh, handmade Valentine's Day cards, and it makes a good space for students to interact with each other, uh, talk with each other, and really build that uh, shared sense of community with each other over crafts like this and, and puzzles. So even for events that we do plan that have a specific time commitment, so for example, the scene workshop that we held um, for an hour on a Wednesday during Band Books Week, we try to take that event and also um, create a passive programming component where students who can't attend at this time can still participate in some way. So for this example, we held a zine workshop. We lectured on uh, the history of zines and how they have been used as tools by marginalized peoples to share their voices, share their views, um, on their own platform when other platforms might not have been available to them. And beyond the lecture, we ended with a event where students were asked to create 
their own zine pages. And those pages would later be collected into one giant coming campus zine and distributed for free around campus. So um, beyond just having that station available at the workshop itself, we also created one and put it in the library space and kept it up throughout Band Books Week. So students could stop by on their own time. Um, you'll see on the table, it's kind of small, but those are all zine prompts. So students could answer the prompts, decorate these pages, hand them into a librarian, and also have their work included in that campus-wide zine as well. So um, students who couldn't make it to the workshop could still kind of have a taste of this zine making experience. One of the things that happened at the Henry campus was a scavenger hunt that encouraged students to go find the library. Um, so there's kind of a multi-prong approach with one staff person being in the library and me being in the center to introduce those students to myself and to the library and uh, encourage them to go seek out library help and remind them that the library is essential to uh, their academic success. Success. So in trying to reach students, one of the easiest ways is to go where the students are. Um, this may be easiest when there's a university-wide event or a campus event, or maybe even if it's just a really busy day. Um, here's a picture of some of my colleagues at the Mercer Atlanta campus. And you can see just a whole gathering of students behind them uh, that were participating in this event. Uh, but this was a table we had set up outside the library. There was a lot of good energy, a lot of good community effort around um, this. Uh, so I'm not even sure what event this was because we tried to do this as much as we could to get out of the library space, get to interact with students, uh, show them our faces. Um, at Henry County, I would set up in the middle. Um, we had a long building and the middle was the entrance and the library was off to one side. So some students didn't even go down that way to even get to the library. So having me there as a face to say, hey, you should come to the library, it's at the other end of the building, was a great way to introduce myself and to get students comfortable with thinking about the library. Um, so get out, uh, go to other events, uh, sink your library outreach into community-centered uh, uh, events um, and get out there, promote yourself. Uh, we have had handouts, a lot of uh, swag. Students particularly enjoyed those. Um, the networking with other departments was a good way to get invited to these events and got a lot of faculty buy-in and also got you invited to classes, which was nice. One of the early challenges I faced was that there had not been a librarian at my location for a little while before I started working. So I had to do a lot of legwork to reach out to faculty uh, in order to get um, some more faculty buy-in interaction with the library, being invited back to classes and being invited to events and getting involved in scavenger hunts for orientation. So that was some legwork that I needed to do to to help out the library and our efforts to reach students. Yeah. And I think building those connections with faculty and other departments is really crucial because ultimately we are all trying to reach and meet the needs of the same population, these commuter students. And we're all having the same challenges in planning events or for people with really busy schedules and really um, who may not have the time to participate. So um, coordinating our efforts is something that can be really helpful. So one thing that we did at Southern Crescent Tech was that um, we started an event in collaboration with other departments. So we had tutoring, we had workforce initiatives, career services, um, and we all got together to have a tech fair um, like Williams orientation event at Henry. It was outside of the library space. So it was in the main atrium of the um, Griffin building where students came in and out. And um, they were invited to participate in this tech fair where they could stop by these different tables and learn more about um, the technological tools and support that these different uh, departments offered. So by kind of concentrating our efforts we were able to um, collectively market this to students. We were able to come up with better prizes and incentives for participating. And it ended up being a pretty successful event that we ran a couple times 
um, over the next few years. One way to get more traction with students is by working with other departments. They may be able to connect other students in a way that the library doesn't usually see. Uh, we recently partnered with Student Affairs Department to get prizes for our Black History Month event we did. Uh, we also promoted their trivia events during our more passive program for uh, their Black History Month trivia. Uh, this was some good interdepartmental collaboration and it got some students involved in both programs that may not have been involved in either. So one thing that I found out the hard way when I started out as a new librarian on a commuter campus is that um, events that I just assumed would be a slam dunk were not. So I just figured that college students would be interested in Harry Potter event, but a lot of our students at the um, Flint River campus at Southern Crescent were older non-traditional students. They did not care about Harry Potter, and um, an event that was just an event for fun wasn't really enough incentive to inspire um, people to drop what they were doing, find a babysitter for their kids, um, try to find another person to cover their shift on their job, to come participate in an event. So really, um, just having an event that is fun isn't often enough motivation to encourage students to attend, even if they might want to. So um, in terms of finding incentives that will encourage students to participate, one slam dunk is usually when we can convince faculty to offer their students extra credit for attending an event. And so we try to build up good relationships where, with our faculty, where if we create an event that we think would benefit their students, we reach out to them and ask them, um, what they think and if they would consider offering extra credit. So um, one event in which that really paid off was at Southern Crescent, I was asked to start a book club and I was really concerned about getting attendance for this because um, even though I thought this would be a really beneficial thing for students, a book club is a time commitment. Beyond asking students to just read, um, or sorry, to attend the event itself, you're also asking them to make time to read an entire book on top of all of their schoolwork. So um, I spoke to the English faculty at the Flint River campus at Southern Crescent, and um, they're very excited about this because they wanted to encourage their students to read more, um, particularly books that were not usually on like an English curriculum. And so um, they were happy to offer their students extra credit to attend. And as a result, we had a pretty healthy book club on that campus. And students ended up enjoying it. Uh, we got a lot of positive feedback from them after uh, we wrapped up the book club. Same thing with the zine event. Um, for that one, we figured our art appreciation instructor would be a good partner for this, and he was very happy to encourage his students to attend the zine workshop. This actually even led to a better working relationship with our art faculty too. Prior to this, we had really had no interaction with him, but um, he was so enthusiastic about us reaching out to him about um, the zine workshop that he subsequently invited librarians to come into his class and um, talk to his students about library resources. So this ended up um, opening up a library instruction opportunity for us as well. One of the good initiatives we found is food. <laughs> Um, always a good motivator, right? Uh, but again, populations are different, and uh, my experiences at Mercer showed me that they, the Mercer students enjoyed more healthy food, water, apples, uh, granola as opposed to canned stuff. Uh, they definitely liked the popcorn more than the chips. Um, and we would do this uh, kind of uh, passive food programming uh, at the end of every semester, sometimes during midterms, to try to get students uh, involved. Uh, now, some of the drawbacks are that if students don't come into the library, that they sort of miss this. Um, and also, if you get the wrong food, they may not participate. I did an event where there was pizza, and there were no students that came, even though it was highly advertised. And uh, my coworker and I took home like four boxes of pizza uh, because just no one came to get it. 
also at these events, we like to uh, give out library swag. Um, some of the more popular items have been uh, those uh, glass cleaners. Uh, students seem to like that. We also give an important bookmark, uh, which gives some information in case students want to contact us later. And those seem to go over very well with students. They, they end up taking them. Um, and they like things like pencils and flashlights. Uh, depending on the population, they might enjoy something different. So William mentioned earlier that when he was at Mercer, a lot of students didn't even know that they had a library there because it was tucked away in one wing of the larger building. And so often at a commuter campus, your students might not necessarily think of the library as a place to go or as a place that could be helpful to them. And this is particularly something that we saw at um, technical college system. A lot of our students who are, for example, in the welding or cosmetology programs would think, why do I need research help? Why do I need library help? And they might go their entire college career without stepping foot in the library. So a lot of the times when we planned our library events, we wanted to reach out to our commuter students, not only to let them know that we were here, but also how we could help them and uh, what resources we had to offer for them. So we're often sneaking these instruction opportunities into our events. So what you're seeing pictured here is something that we did at Southern Crescent where um, one Friday out of every month we would set up coffee and um, free snacks and we would put them out um, first come first serve you can come up and get them until they run out and we would also set it up at the circulation desk and in, in order to get to the food you had to walk through this entire display featuring some of our staff picks um, some laptops that would show resources on Galileo or some lib guides that we had created and um, also it just created an opportunity to talk with students. And a lot of the times the students who came up for the coffee were students who might not otherwise come into the library space. They just heard free coffee and they're like, oh, sign me up. So uh, we ended up increasing our engagement um, with students this way and familiarizing them with our resources and we familiarized them with us and that we were friendly and not scary people. <laughs> this is also, I want to point out that um, often when you are working on a commuter campus, you might not have a huge budget. So this is something that we could do very cheaply. It was just um, some coffee that we put into our coffee maker every month and um, staff would volunteer to make the pastries. So uh, we could do it without spending a ton of money. We also wanted to use our events to get students more comfortable with the space. So in Southern Crescent, I know it's kind of hard to see in this bottom right hand photograph, but you'll see you come in the library doors here and then we have a computer section to the right. And beyond that is the rest of the collection and a lot of our other resources. So students a lot of the time would just make a beeline towards the computers and then just immediately leave once they were done printing or doing their online homework. So we wanted to encourage students to get to know the rest of the library space more and what kinds of resources it contained. So um, something that we did a lot was um, we found that free printing was a really hot commodity at the Southern Crescent um, Griffin campus. Students really wanted extra print funds. So uh, we would offer that as a prize. So students who would find um, different objects hidden around the library could bring that object up to the circulation desk and um, we would add X amount of free pages to their print quota. And it was always really simple to execute. We would try to strategically place these little figures, like um, in this instance, we did something for Falcon's Day and we hid little falcons around the library. Um, we tried to place them um, amongst our DVDs, amongst our magazines, our reference materials, um, materials that we thought students should know about, but that they may have never ventured far enough into the library to know about. And um, lastly, we try to 
go a step beyond just introducing students to the librarians and introducing them to the space and maybe trying to fold in some opportunities for information literacy instruction in there as well. So I'm going to use the Coming Campus Art Show as an example of this. We asked students to um, submit their artwork digitally into our institutional repository for this event. And when they did that, we asked them to enter metadata and other um, key terms or keywords that they thought would help making their make their work more discoverable within the institutional repository. So they had to think critically about keywords. We also introduced them to other publishing op and presentation opportunities for their artwork. So getting them to think about scholarship beyond just the traditional research paper, but to think about creative work as scholarship too, and how they could um, share their work in other venues. So for example, through the school's literary magazine, which is the Chesity Review, at the um, Georgia Undergraduate Research Conference. So we try to inform students that art shows were uh, on their coming campus weren't the only places where they could share their work. And lastly, we wanted to finish up by talking about what I personally think is the most important component of planning events on commuter campuses, which is planning events that will give students the opportunity to feel like their talents are seen, are valued, are encouraged, and also give students with common interests a chance to meet each other, just to, um, to foster this um, sense of community that we were talking about before. And um, just to show you another art show event that we planned on a another campus. This one's at also at Southern Crescent. Um, we try to incorporate this uh, drawing table where we just laid out some butcher paper. So students could just come up, sit at this station, and draw and just add their own artwork if they hadn't submitted their art um, earlier. Also, um, we would host receptions, and students who had submitted their art would attend, and it would give them a chance to mingle with each other, hear about um, the thought processes that went be behind the artwork that they've created, and to just make friends with common interests. And um, so the art show wasn't just a way to smuggle in this information literacy instruction. It was also a chance to celebrate students, the work that they have done, and to connect them with each other. Another similar event that we did at Southern Crescent was um, for National Poetry Month. We put up a poetry wall where librarians shared some of their favorite works of poetry, but we also encouraged students to submit their own poetry as well, and we would print and show off their work here in the library space. And um, students who had submitted their poetry were really proud to see their work up on the walls. They would come bring their friends, show off their poetry that was being displayed in the library space, and it was just a fun way to get students engaged um, on campus. So we all know it's been challenging um, times recently, uh, but as librarians, we're agents of creating that sense of community by our presence, whether that's in person uh, for that poetry event or online with uh, some creative ideas for study breaks. Um, we contributed to an ongoing sense of normalcy in dealing with our students that we had already created relationships with throughout the semester while we were there and continuing on with those relationships in uh, the spring semester via video consultations or being in their classrooms via uh, sessions. Uh, so that helped um, contribute to that sense of community. And sometimes it felt like we were hearing more about the students' lives rather than their, their research needs. Yeah, and I think what William has pointed out is also really important in terms of um, what we had mentioned before about uh, fostering a collegiate sense of community, where a big part of that is students feeling like uh, the school and the school's members cared about their success and their well-being on campus. And um, just being able to talk with students um, 
even after we had gone fully remote, I think it helped them to feel like there was still like a lifeline to their normal college experience and their normal college life. Um, we also, uh, during our social distancing time at the end of this past semester, we tried to plan some remote virtual events. Like um, during finals week, we typically plan uh, like a relaxation station on campus with coloring sheets and puzzles. Of course, we couldn't do that this semester. So um, we tried to give students a chance to um, unwind and also if they were feeling lonely and isolated in their homes to connect with each other by setting up this um, virtual jackbox game in Microsoft Teams. So um, we hosted a game and we were able to, uh, we had two Steam platforms available for this. So um, we could have hosted 16 students. We didn't have a huge turnout. We only had one student show up. So it was a Jackbox game with three librarians and one student. And it was still fun, but I'm hoping that we could take events like this and flesh them out more over the course of the summer for students who still want to feel like they have some kind of um, campus life, even if they can't actually come to campus while we are closed for the summer semester. So um, this is an option that we are still exploring. Thank you for letting us present to you today. Here are our references. And if you have any uh, questions for us, then feel free to get in touch with us and uh, we can chat about commuter students and their place in the university. Thank you for your time. Good enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's wrapped. Nailed it. <laughs>